yeah, so that people who are, didn't join can, can see it later on. Okay, please go ahead, Bill. Okay, the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon. Um, so I'm, I'm not trying to teach physics in this talk. Uh, you have many great professors who will do that. So I'm just trying to convince you that physics is uh, interesting. So um, now if you have a question, uh, uh, you know, raise your hand or use the chat. Uh, don't wait till the end of the talk because then you'll be completely lost. So, and Katebi will tell me uh, when there is a uh, question. Yes. Okay, this is a, a matter particle circa 1930s. So uh, we had the proton and the neutron. <clears throat> uh, no, note that the neutron is uh, heavier than the proton. And also, uh, but it's heavier by 0.1%. Uh, by okay. Um, this is gonna turn out to be very important. Um, of course, the proton charge is plus, the neutron is zero. Uh, the proton has um, the strong electromagnetic weak and, and gravitational forces. Um, it has a size of about 10 to the minus 15 meters. Uh, and it's, it's spin one half. Now, uh, so yeah, so the spin is Planck's constant divided by two, but everything is Planck's constant. So we just say spin one half. Uh, classically, this is crazy. I mean, how can they all have exactly the same spin, and uh, they'd be spinning at the you know at the same rate, and they never slow down? But but this is quantum, and quantum is a new world, as we'll see. <clears throat> uh, then then we had the electron, which is much lighter. Um, so, so the proton and the neutron are in the nucleus. That's why there's a strong nuclear force. The electron and the neutrino are, are not in the nucleus, so they don't have the strong force. Uh, as far as we can tell, they're point, point like particles. And so the limit is uh, 10 to the minus 20 uh, meters. Okay, now in the 1920s, uh, two young physicists could understand their data if the electron was spinning. So they wrote a paper and then, then the big boss came back from sabbatical. And so he, he, he said, oh, this is, you know, this is our paper, this is great. And he said, oh my God, you didn't. He says, I, I thought of this, but uh, this, this would mean that the edge of, uh, of the electron was spinning at faster than the speed of light. So they said, oh, it must be wrong. So they tried to pull the paper, but it was already published. <clears throat> and um, as, <clears throat> as, as we will see, the, the electron having spin half is very important, it turned out. So it, it, we're gonna find out later in the talk that the electron has spin one half so that we could be here to discover that the electron has spin one half. Okay, this is the forces in the, in the symmetries circa the 1970s. So we have the strong force, the electromagnetic force, the weak force, the gravity, and then the Higgs, which, which uh, gives mass to, to the particles. <clears throat> now, um, in the 1970s, the, the theorists found that what was really important were the symmetries. And if you told them the symmetry, they could derive the force. So, so we call the standard model. Now, now, these are very deep mathematical symmetries. So I cannot, um, um, I, I, I cannot discuss uh, at, at this level what they are. So this, we say the standard model is SU3, which is the, the symmetry of the strong force, SU2, which is the uh, symmetry of uh, the electroweak and, and U1. OSU2 is the weak and, and U1 is the electromagnetic. And the carrier is the gluon, the photon, the W, the graviton, and the H. And, and these have spin one here. Graviton has spin two and the H has spin uh, zero. Uh, so Katevi, any um, any questions yet? 
Sorry, I was muted. No question yet. Oh, okay. Okay, so now let's discuss the, uh, the weak force because um, uh, to me, the weak force is the most interesting one. So it, tr it turns out that a free neutron decays with a half-life of uh, 10 minutes. So a, a, a neutron will decay to a proton, electron, and antineutrino. Uh, if the Earth or the Sun were filled with lead, 93 million miles of lead, uh, and the Sun emits a lot of neutrinos, most of the neutrinos would still get through. So, so this means that the, the weak interaction is ridiculously weak. Okay, so when, when it was first discovered, you know, people said, why, why do we need this? It is so weak. Uh, wh why do we need such a, a, a very, very weak force? Well, it turns out that without the weak force, we wouldn't be here, as we'll see a little bit later. So, um, so, so for a strong decay, an N star going to a proton pion, um, you don't know what these are, but it doesn't matter. It's, it's, they decay by the strong force. And the, this has a lifetime of 10 to the minus 22 seconds. Okay, well, 10 minutes is, is a lot longer than 10 to the minus 22 seconds, which is just saying the weak force is very weak. So an electromagnetic K, decay like a pi zero to two gamma is, is um, 10 to the minus 18 seconds, which is still tiny compared to 10 minutes. So what, what we can do is we can take this neutrino and bring it over to the other side. We can take the anti-neutrino and bring it over and it becomes a neutrino. So, so this tells us that by the weak interaction, a proton and electron can annihilate and actually make a neutron and a neutrino. Uh, this is hydrogen. So in the sun, there's a huge amount of hydrogen. <clears throat> um, so, so we get a, a neutron and a neutrino. As soon as you get a, a neutron, it is captured by an, a proton by the strong force uh, to make uh, deuterium. And of course, this is fusion, and this is how we get energy from the sun. So without the weak interaction, there would be no energy from the sun, and we would have no elements except what we had after the Big Bang, which was hydrogen and helium. Uh, the strength of the weak force actually determines the lifetime of the sun. Okay, so now here's a question. Why don't neutrons in the nucleus decay? So anybody who has an answer to the questions or wants to take a guess, uh, you should uh, you should speak. So people are still very shy to be able. <laughs> Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah. Why? Okay. So the question is the the last one. Why don't neutrons in the nucleus decay? So up here, I was careful to say a free neutron decays in 10 minutes, okay? Um, so why, why don't neutrons in, the nu in a nucleus decay? We have lots of neutrons in a nucleus and, 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 and we know that the, uh, the lifetime of a, a, a nucleus is not 10 minutes. Uh, so, uh, so in freshman physics, what are the conservation laws? That, what are some of the conservation laws that you learn? Bill, there is a response. Uh on the chat that they, this may be due to the interactions in the nucleus of why the neutrons are not decaying in the nucleus. Yes, exactly, that's exactly it. Yes, so that, yeah, that's very good. 
So, uh, so the binding energy of the deuteron is 2.2 MeV. So if the neutron were 0.1% heavier, uh, the deuteron would be radioactive. So if, so the binding energy of the deuteron is 2.2 MeV, uh, this is greater than the uh, mass difference between the proton and the neutron. The neutron were 0.1% heavier, uh, it would be above, it would be at 2.2 MeV and the deuteron would be radioactive. Uh, that would be quite bad. If the proton were heavier than the neutron, rather than the neutron heavier than the proton, then hydrogen would be radioactive. And that would be um, very bad for us. So physics is exactly what it has to be in order for us to be here to discover the laws of physics. Okay, now, so now, now we're getting to um, quantum mechanics. Now things are gonna, gonna get hairier. So this was developed in 1910 to 1950 <laughs> by uh, Niels Bohr, who says anyone who thinks they understand quantum mechanics and is not deeply disturbed by it, doesn't understand quantum mechanics. Albert Einstein said, God doesn't play dice. And Aaron Schrodinger said, I wish I never discovered these damn wave functions. So he was talking about the Schrodinger wave functions for which you won the Nobel Prize. Um, now, I, I, I love quantum mechanics. It, it is so interesting. The math is uh, incredibly beautiful. And it's, it's, it's not trivial. Um, so, you know, two, two plus two equals four. Well, that's true, but, you know, it's kind of boring. A quantum mechanics is, is not boring. Um, and that's for sure. So I, I find talking to uh, uh, my physicist friends, um, about 90% of them uh, hate quantum mechanics. Uh, so so, so I'm, in, I'm in the minority. So in quantum mechanics, uh, the electron is described by the Schrodinger wave function psi. Now in quantum mechanics, which is a mathematical theory, of course, uh, let's suppose we want to rotate by an angle theta, okay? So the new wave function is e to the i, the spin times um, theta times the old wave function. So now we can calculate the new wave function given this, if we know the spin and the old wave function. So, so, so this uh, just happens to be, you know, cosine the spin times theta plus i sine the spin times theta times the old wave function. Now we're, go we're gonna look at a simple case, so a very simple case. So um, theta equals 360 degrees. So we're just gonna rotate all the way around one turn so therefore, uh, psi prime um, equals um, cosine of two pi, two pi is 360 degrees times the spin times the, the old wave function. Okay, so if spin is zero, uh, what is the new wave function compared to the old wave function? So anybody? So what's, what's cosine of zero? They say, people, you need to talk. It's, uh, this is interactive. I think you guys know all of these things. So you shouldn't be shy here. Okay, Bill, it should be one. One. <laughs> one. Excellent. Now st stay on the line. <laughs> stay on the line. I got somebody who, uh, on the line here. Uh, that is the professors <laughs> who are answering. So. <laughs> the professor. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's, that's better than nobody, I guess. <laughs> exactly. Now, exactly. now if, if the spin is one, the spin is one. What is the the cosine of two pi? Two pi zero. <laughs> no, uh, cosine of two pi is one. Yeah. Now, if, if, yeah. If the spin is one half, you have cosine of pi. Right. So what would the cosine of pi be? Yeah, that, that, that would be zero then. But I don't want to be answered. Oh, it's minus one, it's minus one. Minus one, zero, minus, pi sur yeah. deux. 
Wait, 19. Cosine, cosine of 180 is, is minus one. Oh, yes, that's right. Yeah. Okay, so this, this is crazy. If you, so if you, have a, if you have a spin zero particle and you rotate 360 degrees, the new wave function is the old wave function. And if you have a spin one, like the photon, you rotate, the new wave function is the old fun wave function. But if you have spin one half, like an electron or a proton or a neutron, uh, then you get minus the wave function. Well, how can you get minus the wave function if you just rotate through one complete circle? Um, now, now suppose we try to put two neutrons at the same place at the same time. Okay, we can always take one wave function and rotate 360 degrees. And then we get minus the wave function. Well, the wave function minus the wave function is zero. So this says you cannot put two neutrons in the same place at the same time if it has spin one half. So this is called spin statistic symmetry. Um, and th this is what gives us uh, chemistry. You know, when you learn chemistry, you learn you, you had to fill up all of these um, energy levels because you could only have one electron in, in a given energy level. Uh, now, this is just a pure symmetry. This is just this argument. So we cannot put two neutrons at the same place at the same time, not because that there's a repulsive force or anything like that. Uh, there was a question on the chat whether s is an integer or not. I f forgot to let you know. Uh, what, oh, what, the spin? Yeah, well, they, right. they were asking about s. Yeah, OK. So so for, for, for the matter particles, which is proton, neutron, electron, neutrino, spin is 1 half. Okay, Very, very important. If it wasn't spinning, we wouldn't be here. We would have no chemistry. Now the um, now the, the force particles are integer, so 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 zero, one, or two. So so the photon is is spin one. Spin one, you can put you can put as many photons as you want to. If you turn on a light, you get photons. If you turn on two lights, you get twice as many. Turn on a hundred lights, you get a hundred times as many. You cannot put a hundred physicists in a room. Why? Because there's been one half. Okay, guys, this is crazy, but this is quantum mechanics. And, um, and if, it, if it wasn't this way, we wouldn't be here. Spin one half are matter particles, spin zero, one, two are force particles. Very simple, but very profound. And it's just a symmetry. It's just a simple symmetry. It's ridiculously easy to calculate, but it has a profound uh, uh, results. By the, by the way, we're going to find that all the phys laws of physics have to be what they are, because if you change them, we're not here. So, um, so now um, a magnetic moment. So like the electron is spinning, and the electron is charged, and a spinning charge creates a magnetic field. So we parameterize this as uh, mu, the magnetic moment, and this is equal to G, the charge, the spin over the mass. Uh, so, so these guys are here to make the units come out right. All the physics is in G, which is the dimensionalist constant. So, so the Dirac equation predicted G equals two for a spin one half point particle. So it was, it was measured for the proton um, and, and, and G, G was 5.6. Uh, 5.6 is not two. Uh, this was finally explained in the 1960s by the quark model. So the proton is not a point particle. It's made up of uh, three quarks. And um, so, 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 so you, you, get, you get more or less three times two. I mean, this is a hand-waving argument, but uh, and, and this was and this was measured in the 1930s. So you can see this is a pretty powerful technique. The electron was measured to be 2.0. Uh, 
Now Oppenheimer and others uh, calculated the first order correction to two and they got infinity. Um, so when, when you calculate something in the theory and get infinity, that means uh, there's something wrong with your theory. Okay, now, now we go to, um, to um, the spin one half particles, you know, which were, which were known by um, the uh, 1980s, 1990s. So, so now instead of proton and neutron, we have U and D quarks, okay? And we have electron and neutrino. This is their masses. Now, it turns out that, <laughs> this is crazy again. There's a heavy version of the U, there's a heavy version of the S, there's a heavy version of the electron, there's a heavy version of the neutrino. Um, and then there's another one, another heavy version. So it's three generations, three generations of the, of the, of the, of the matter particles. Well, this is absolutely crazy. Um, however, if, if it wasn't this way, we wouldn't be here. So, well, so we'll get to that in, um, in a few more slides. Now, so the muon is simply a heavy electron, as far as we know. Um, it, it could be different. And in fact, now coming out of uh, LHCb, there is evidence that it, it is different. It's really not just a heavy electron, but, but it has not been, these experiments are interesting, but they have not been definitively um, um, uh, proven. Anyway, I'm, I'm just like a, new, a neutron decays by the weak interaction, the muon decays by a weak interaction to, to an electron and neutrino antineutrino. Okay, Katevi, do we have any questions? Uh, no, no questions so far. Okay, now I, I have to tell you that if you don't understand this, nobody understands this. Okay. <laughs> and it's crazy. Uh, uh, however, this is what, it, we, what we always find out decades later, once we do the math, is that if we, if we didn't have this, if we didn't have three generations, we wouldn't be here. Okay, so now we get to symmetries. Uh, th this is what the, uh, the theorists do. And I mean, I could never be a theorist because th these thoughts would never occur to me. <laughs> So, so that, that is a question, um, Kale, Kenny. You say you have a question? Uh, please, can you go back to, to slide 11? Yeah. Yes, I, I see that you gave a mass, you put a mass for, for the neutrino. So I was wondering about this mass. Where did you get this mass? Is this a limit? Because uh, where is mass from? Yes, that's a very, uh, okay. Yeah, that's, uh, that's very, very, very interesting. Um, we, um, we now know, uh, so in, 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 yeah, this is a good question. So in the standard model, uh, the neutrinos had zero mass. Uh, we now know that they, they do have mass. Okay. And I have, uh, the, the mass is not known exactly. But I, yeah, but it's you know it's known to a factor of two or three or something. So I put in the order of magnitude here. Okay, it's just yeah. an order of magnitude. It's not a, a measurement. That's, that's the order of magnitude. We we know the masses to a factor of two or three or four or something like that. But you know when 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 all of when all of these guys are greater than one and all of these guys are ten to the minus seven or. Um, you you know that the neutrinos are very very light compared to that that they're not zero, uh, and and there are a lot of experiments going on to try to um, to measure this more accurately. I, it's okay for me. I just want to. Okay, that's, that's a that's a good question. Now, now another thing here. So here the down, which you know is is like the neutron, and the up, which is like the proton. So so again, we see that. Um, they're very close in mass. They're, they're very close together. 
which is what you have to have to have stable nuclei. Now, but now look at the next generation, which is as basic as this. And so now the, the positive, the, the more highly charged is much more massive. And here, so, so we're just lucky these are so close together and that the, the down is slightly heavier than the up. Okay, so symmetry, so charge symmetry. So you change a particle to an antiparticle. You, you, uh, you can't do this, but mathematically you can do it. If you have a mathematical theory, you know, you write down an equation for a particle, you write down the equation for an antiparticle. Are the laws of physics the same? Is electromagnetism the same for particle and antiparticle? I don't know how the theorists think of these things. Uh, parity symmetry. It's like looking in a mirror. X goes to minus X. So if you do an experiment and then you look at it in a mirror, do you get the same laws of physics, the same laws of electromagnetism? T symmetry changes T to minus T. We can't, we can't do this physically. But with our equations, we can do it. Um, now, when you, you, you have to get the same laws of physics with t, it, with time going backwards, right? How could you not get the same laws of physics with time going backwards? So these are very good symmetries for the strong electromagnetic and gravity. But it was discovered in the 1950s to 1960s that all of them are broken symmetries in the weak interaction. Okay, so if time is going forward and then time is going backwards, you're not gonna get, you're not gonna get to our past because the laws of physics are different for only for the weak interaction, okay? Now, what, what we're going to learn uh, later, and it always takes us a couple of decades to figure this out, is that without these broken symmetries in the weak interaction, we wouldn't be here. So without the weak interaction, we wouldn't be here. Okay, Katevi, do we have any questions? Uh, no, no question and no comments so far. Okay, now, if you don't understand this, nobody understands it. So I'm, my, 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 my goal is not to make you understand it because none of us understand it. My goal is to convince you that it's interesting and that's something you want to know more about. So you, know, you would take the courses. Now in the standard model, we can only get this if there are three or more ways for a given reaction to go and then get uh, quantum mechanical interference with the three amplitudes with at least one imaginary amplitude. Now, so I is the square root of minus one. So the, uh, the mathematicians uh, discovered this in, um, in the 1800s. So I, I remember when I was in high school, the teacher said, what is the square root of minus one? I said, well, there's no square root of minus one. <laughs> and she says, yeah, it's I. I said, okay, well, what is I? She said, I is the square root of minus one. I thought, you know, I thought she was crazy. <laughs> uh, it turns out to be very interesting and the math of imaginary numbers is, is very interesting. Now in the 1800s, uh, the mathematicians worked out all the math, but they, they thought that this would never describe something that was real. That's why they called it an imaginary number. It, it turns out that without, without an imaginary number, we wouldn't be here. So, so, so to get this, we need at least three generations. And in the Big Bang, all the non-neutrino particles and antiparticles, because in the Big Bang, you make particles and antiparticles, everything should have annihilated. Um, so like, a, uh, like an electron and an anti-electron annihilate to light. So we should have had a universe of light without any matter. However, uh, if you if these if these symmetries are broken, okay, this means that all the matter and antimatter did not annihilate. 
So due to this symmetry breaking, um, so, uh, you know, electron, anti-electron annihilate to a photon, and we're, we're left with this tiny remnant of 10 to the minus nine. So 10 to the nine of the protons and antiprotons annihilate, one of the protons didn't, and that became us. Okay, now, um, okay, so now, so now I, I told you uh, that the Dirac equation predicted two for, uh, for, for the magnetic moment for, for an electron or a muon. Uh, now it turns out for technical reasons, it's easier to do this experiment with a muon rather than electron. So now I'm now going to talk about muons, not electrons. <clears throat> uh, so in 1948, what's, uh, so after World War II, so Robbie, uh, Robbie was at the uh, MIT Rad Lab and um, uh, developing radar. So he took one of these big, very expensive amplifiers back to Columbia and he measured uh, G of, of the electron more accurately. There's a question on the chat. Okay, yeah. Are these three generations related to the disproportion between matter and antimatter? Yes. Yes. So, um, so the theorists worked this out and um, so, so uh so we have so we, so we have these three generations now so yeah well, so we can look down here at the electron and the electron neutrino the muon and the muon neutrino the tau and the tau neutrino now you need an imaginary number now so they worked it out if 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 this was the only thing we had all, all of the amplitudes would be real if we had two Okay, then the matrix would be, you know, cosine theta, sine theta, minus sine theta, cosine theta. Oh, this is real. It turns out if you have three generations down here, okay, then you have a three by three matrix, and and one one, and and it's possible to have an imaginary uh, amplitude. What happens in quantum mechanics is that that these go in all possible ways. And there's, there's one way you where you pick up an imaginary phase. Okay. When when you do when you do the math, and um, I, I I can't show you this because the, the theorists do math, which is way over my head. So so we have we have we have the theorists telling us what experiments are interesting, and then I do the experiments. <clears throat> They, they need an imaginary amplitude in order to get this, um, this uh, matter antimatter asymmetry. Uh, okay, now, uh, uh, yeah, all, all I can say is that this is, this is what the theorists tell us. Of course, we, we discovered that there were three generations. And then it was decades later when the theorists finally did the math and worked this out. So if we had two generations instead of three, we wouldn't be here. Which which is crazy because we're, you know, we're 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 made out of the the lowest generation, of course. Okay, so now get um so do we have any other questions or no. No. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, so after World War II, Robbie measured the G of the electron um, uh, more uh, accurately, and 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 you um, and you remember that the Dirac equation predicted two, and then Oppenheimer, when he tried to do the first order correction, got infinity. Um, so he Robbie found that it wasn't two. So. Uh, so, so what we call the anomalous magnetic moment is G minus two over two. 
and he found that it was 0 0.0011, which is neither two nor infinity, which is interesting. So then Schwinger et al were at the conference, found out about it, and then the, um, they developed what is called quantum electrodynamics. Um, and they did, uh, they, they discovered renormalization, which get, gets rid of the infinities that Oppenheimer was bothered by. Um, so for any new theory, someone comes up with a new theory, the first question is, is it renormalizable? Um, ah, yeah, so nowadays, yeah, uh, you can just type into your search engine QED renormalization, and they they'll tell you uh, how to get rid of the infinities, which um, uh, which I don't understand, but the theorists do, so that's okay. Now, the anomalous magnetic moment is due to quantum mechanics. Okay, the reason is not two, G is not two, is due to quantum mechanics. Now, the, the energy of the vacuum classically is zero. So classically, you say, we have a vacuum. What is the energy of the vacuum? Classically, of course, it's zero. Now, in quantum mechanics, you have the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Uh, the uncertainty in the energy times the uncertainty in the time is Planck's constant. So, so the problem with zero, the classical value of zero, is that it has no uncertainty. Quantum mechanics tells you it has to have uncertainty. So therefore, we know that the energy of the vacuum is not zero. But, you know, what is it? Okay, so now, so now if you, if you have a muon, okay, so, so all of these diagrams show that this is a muon line here. So, you know, if, if, if Speaking classically now, if you have a muon and you take a snapshot of it, 99.9% .9 of the time, what you find is it's just a muon. Okay, there's nothing else. But 0.1% of the time, you find it's all of this stuff. Okay, so now Heisenberg told us that the uncertainty in the energy times the uncertainty in the time in quantum mechanics is Planck's constant. And um, so, you know, how, how do you get energy? Well, you get energy with particles, antiparticles. So you get all of these interesting particles, antiparticles. So, so the vacuum has all particles and antiparticles in it. <clears throat> so the theorists calculate this and they put in all of the particles and antiparticles and forces that they know of. Okay, and then they, then they calculate it, which is a very, very hard job. Uh, and, and we have a lot of brilliant theorists uh, working on it. Uh, and then we can do the experiment and we can see if they agree or not. If they don't agree, there are other particles or forces or symmetries that they didn't put into this. So now, so I, I, I got into the, this experiment in the 19, 1990 and looking at these diagrams, I said, you know, what about Einstein's general theory of relativity? I mean, if the energy of the vacuum is not zero, that is going to affect gravity, Einstein's general theory of relativity, which is his theory of gravity. So I went and asked a theorist, and uh, he said, ah, you've discovered uh, Einstein's cosmological constant problem. Go read this article, <laughs> which turned out to be very, very, very interesting. So Einstein, when he worked out general relativity, gravity, it has a cosmological constant, which he called lambda. Now Einstein at first had a static universe. Okay, so he chose the value of lambda to stop the universe from collapsing because if you have a static universe under gravity, it's going to collapse. So it, it, it and, and that's an, that's attractive, of course. Um, it, it so he put in a, rep, a repulsive 
I, I shouldn't say a repulsive, oh, okay. Uh, because I'm an experimentalist, I'll say a repulsive force, but it's not really a, it's not really a force. And that way he got a static universe. Then Hubble et al found that the universe was expanding. Uh, now there was no need for the cosmological constant. So Einstein said this was the biggest blunder of his life. Now we, now we get to the 1960s and the theorists found they were, were able to calculate from quantum mechanics the energy of the vacuum due to all of this. So they, they did exactly what my question was. They said, let's calculate the effect of all of this on gravity. Um, and, and, they, and they found lambda was 10 to the 120th. Now, Steve Weinberg says, look, we need lambda less than two. We need lambda less than two for us to exist. <laughs> this, 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 is a, this is a big problem. Uh, now, what, what's called dark energy was discovered in the 1990s, you know, by looking at distant supernova. And, and that, yeah. Was there a question or? No, there was no question. It was uh, some disturbance. Please go on, sorry. Yeah, yeah no problem. So, and, and they measured it to be lambda 0 0.7, which is less than two, which is good, um, but it's, it's nowhere near 10 to the 120. Um, when it was discovered, it was called dark energy, but it's, it seems to be just Einstein's cosmological constant. So Ed Witten said, this is the worst theoretical embarrassment in the history of physics. Uh, so, um, so, so there's something that we're, we're not getting here, obviously. So a, a new symmetry would, would reduce this 10 to the 120. Um, but, but this is just saying that we, I'm just trying to convince you that there's more physics to be discovered. Um, okay, now for the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon. So our, all particles exist in the vacuum. All particles contribute to the anomalous magnetic moment. Are there new particles beyond the standard model? Are there new symmetries? So, so we set out to measure the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon to uh, 0.5 parts per million as ppm. Uh, the theorist would try to calculate it to 0.5 parts per million. And, and then we would compare and see if there's, if they don't agree, there's something beyond the standard model. Um, and as I said, for technical reasons, it's better to use the muon than the electron. Okay, so how, how do we do it? So we accelerate protons to 24 billion volts. Um, your electrical outlet has 110 volts. So this is a lot bigger. So there's a question. Oh, okay. Uh, yes, uh, can you go back please to the slide 20? Yes, yeah. you said in the last item, you said that for technical reasons, uh, it is better to use muons to calculate the anomalous magnetic moment. I would like to know why. Uh, why do we prefer to calculate this with muons than electrons, for example? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Very, very, very good question. Excellent, excellent question. Yeah, we're getting good questions here. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so, so the muon has a mass of uh, 105. Um, MeV, you don't know what MeV but is, but it doesn't matter. <clears throat> and the electron has a mass of um, 0.5 MeV. Okay, now if you if you if you're trying to um, If, if, you, if, if you're trying to pop all of this stuff, 
Okay, so you're, you you come along with a muon and then you pop all of this stuff out. <clears throat> um, so so the, the the theor the theorists calculated that if the, if there's new heavy stuff that we don't know, okay, um, that that the rate of of doing that goes as uh, the mass of the lepton uh, squared. So so the muon is 200 times heavier than the electron. And it goes as a square. So it's 40,000 times better. Um, so, so, so that's the reason. It's the theoretical reason. You can kind of see it. You know, if you have mass here, if you, if you have the mass of the electron, you got to, you know, kind of borrow this energy so that the, the, the electron mass, so actually the, the electron mass then here would be less. Okay. And, and that, so the muon's a muon, and then here the muon mass would be less. Well, the muon has a lot more, 200 times more mass to allow this to happen. So the, the, theorists, the theorists like the, the muon better than the electron. So then there's a question on the chat, so then what about the tau? Yes, that, that's the question. Yes. If it's about mass, why, why don't you use tau uh, leptons? Yes, these are, these, are, these are very good questions. <clears throat> um, so, 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 uh, so we, we can produce a huge, ah, yeah, yeah. So I will, uh, uh, yeah, so this, so this is uh, 0.1 GeV, this is 1.8 GeV. Um, okay, so, so as I said, we, we, we accelerate protons to uh, 20, 24 billion through 24 billion volts, and then the energy you multiply by the charge to get the energy. So that's the charge is E. So this is this is called uh, GeV. Uh, the protons hit the target. Of course, Einstein's E equals mc squared. So we convert energy into mass. A nuclear reactor converts mass into electrical energy. We use the electrical energy, and then we we convert it to to mass. So we do PP. So we, we create uh, muons, anti-mutons, electrons, anti-electrons. Uh, you create far fewer, uh, it, it turns out, far fewer tau leptons um, because, because they're more massive. OK, so, so, so you put in two factors. One factor you put in is, um, is the mass. And, and the other factor you put in is, is the lifetime. And 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 so, uh, so so it turns out when you put it in the light time, you create muons, and and the muons go um, like a kilometer before they decay. So so we get to measure things over a kilometer. The um, the, the tau goes up about um, a micrometer. So um, before it decays, so so you just don't have you know, so so it's a combination of getting large numbers and then also being able to measure them with a reasonable detector. Um, so some people do some people do the tau, uh, but they are nowhere near as sensitive as as we who do the muons. Okay, that was a very good question though. Yes. There's another question uh, on page 17 regarding the Feynman diagrams, if uh, all these yeah. processes have the same probabilities. Oh, no, they don't have the same probabilities. No, 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 nowhere near. No, each one has a different. The theorists have got to calculate all of them. So the theorists have got to calculate all of them, <laughs> and each one, well, it, you know, any one would be impossible for me to calculate, but. Um, well, you know, they're smart guys. Yeah, that's all the question for now. Yeah, and that was that was an, that was another excellent uh, excellent question. Okay, so as I said, the mass of the muon is 0 0.105 GeV, which is very small compared to 24 uh, GeV. So we make a lot of uh, muons, and then we have a beamline which selects from all of this stuff. 
and then brings it down to our apparatus. Okay, so um, you're probably familiar with a spinning top. So the, the top is spinning and it, it, this arrow shows gravity. And then, um, and then the spinning top, uh, there's a torque on it because it has angular momentum and, um, and it precesses at a, a given frequency. So, it, so you, have the, you have the same torque uh, argument for the magnetic moment. So with the magnetic moment, so this, this would be the, the magnetic field. And then if you have a magnetic moment, it would precess around the magnetic field. And the frequency, if you work it out, is the charge of the muon, the anomalous magnetic moment, which is how much it differs, G differs from two. Um, the, the B field and, and, and the mass. So we wanna know the B field accurately. We wanna know the, the magnetic moment frequent, frequency accurately, and then we can calculate the, the anomaly. So, okay, so, so G equals two comes from just the muon with, with nothing else. And then the difference of two comes from uh, all of this quantum mechanics stuff of uh, particles and antiparticles that you need to satisfy Heisenberg. Okay, so now we get to the experiment. So we have, we have a target all the way over here. So 24 GeV protons at the target. We have a beam line, which uh, selects um, the, the muons that we want. Um, and then we put them into the storage ring. And, uh, and they go about a kilometer uh, round and round and round before they decay. And, and this is our magnetic field. We have the a magnetic field in here. This is the experiment at Brookhaven. Um, yeah, so, th so this is the decay. It's a weak decay, as I said. And the high energy, turns out, the high energy positrons go preferentially in the direction of the muon spin. So this is good. We just have a detector which measures the high energy positrons and we can find out what the spin is doing. And uh, oh, Bill, could you go back to that page? Could you could you clarify a little bit? So this is a uh, positive muons and then the decay is to positrons. Is that uh, could you clarify that's in the page a little bit here? Yes, that yes, that, that is yeah, that is correct. So, so at the Brookhaven experiment. We, yeah, we did, we, we didn't, so we had our beam line select mu plus, and then we did the experiment. So with mu plus, we got a positron. That's right. That was a good question. Um, and, and then we, we also switched the polarity of the magnets, switched the polarity of the beam line, and then we stored mu minus. And with mu minus, we got um, electrons. Yeah, that, that, was, that was a very good question. Yeah, so at um, yeah, so at Brookhaven National Lab, we coming from the target, we get uh, we get about ten to the ten particles and antiparticles per second. So so we are we are like a matter matter antimatter um, factory. And actually, it was discovered in the nineteen sixties um, uh, at Brookhaven. This, this asymmetry between matter and antimatter was, was discovered in the uh, 1960s, and then they got a Nobel Prize for that. Um, uh, a decade or two later, at the time it was a huge, it was a huge surprise. Everyone was surprised that the laws of physics are different for matter and antimatter, and we hadn't figured out yet that we need that to be here. Uh, that came several decades later also. Okay, this is a high energy positron decay time. Uh, so this is the number of decays. You see we have a lot of events. I mean, this is 10, 10 million events per bin. And um, so this is the first 100 microseconds and then the second, third, and it, it, goes, it goes down exponentially because they're decaying. So what we have to do is, is measure this um, frequency to uh, better than half a part per million. 
And uh, th this was our answer. So here are the theoretical calculations of all of those diagrams. The diagrams I showed you are only a small fraction of all of the diagrams, by the way. So, um, so yeah, so this is the calculation in 2006, 2009, 2010, 2011, 2011. So this was, at the time of the Brookhaven experiment, this was the most accurate theory. And then, um, and then this is the experiment, okay? And, um, and they don't agree very well. So if this, if, the, if this was real, it means that there's more symmetries, more particles, more forces that we haven't discovered yet. Um, so it, tur it turns out, if you want to quantify how bad the disagreement is, it's, uh, it's three sigma. Sigma is called a standard deviation. Okay, so how, how likely is three sigma? So, so um, the probability, this is a good approximation, is, um, is x minus x bar squared over two sigma squared, and then you take the, uh, the exponential of, of that with a minus. Okay, let, let's suppose we caught, toss a coin a hundred times. Okay, so how many heads do we expect? Well, we expect 50. So in here, we would put 50. Okay, now uh, the sigma for this case is square root of 50. Okay, this is the sigma here. Um, then you just calculate. So, um, so get, if, you, if you do the experiment and you get 50 heads, and then that would be, um, that would be zero sigma, okay? Because uh, 50 minus 50 uh, would, would be zero. Uh, if you get 43 heads, which is less likely, of course, that's one sigma. If you get uh, 36 heads, that would be two sigma. If you get 29 heads, that would be three sigma. If you get 21 heads, that would be four sigma. So of course, you know, flipping a coin a hundred times and getting 29 heads is not very probable. But you know, so what is the probability? So now I now I just plot the function here. This is the the probability versus sigma. Um, the most likely thing is that you get 50. So the most likely is zero sigma. But then if you go down three sigma, it's, it's rather unlikely. Four sigma is, is even more unlikely. Five sigma uh, is very, very unlikely. Okay, so now, but the, our, our experiment at Brookings was over and now we have a sister laboratory called Fermi National Accelerator Lab. It's an hour west of Chicago, Illinois. Uh, they were on the energy frontier, so they had a center of mass of two TeV, and but then CERN turned on in Geneva, Switzerland, the LHC, and they have a center of mass of thirteen TeV, much higher than two. So our Fermi Lab went from the energy frontier to the intensity frontier, so they were going to build a beam line with twenty times more muons. Well. Obviously, this is what we wanted in order to be able to do a more precise experiment, see whether it was a statistical fluctuation or not. So we decided to move the magnet to Fermilab. We proposed the experiment. It was approved. We have to move the magnet to Fermilab. So here was our building. We had to get the magnet out of the building. So we had to cut a hole in, had to cut a hole in, the, in the wall. Um, then we had to close William Floyd Parkway overnight so we could take it down William Floyd Parkway. This is too wide to let cars by, of course. Um, so this is um, 15 meters diameter. So now, now here we're down at the um, Smith Point uh, Marina. Uh, we put it on a barge, it went around Florida. This is going up the Mississippi up the Illinois River. And then we had to close down Interstate 88 for two nights in order to be able to um, 
get it from the Illinois River dock to Fermilab. This is uh, Interstate 88 at uh, 3 a.m. Yeah, yeah, we, we, could, we could only go at a walking rate because, um, uh, because the engineers calculated that if, if this 15 meter diameter uh, coil uh, vibrated by more than a millimeter, um, it wouldn't work. It would be damaged so badly. So, so basically, this is at a walking pace. So Bill, and, could, you, could you explain why it wasn't dismantled and taken to Fermi Lab and reassembled there? And why do you have to carefully move it around? Uh, oh, yes. So, um, yeah, so, 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 so Fermi Lab, so they were, they were running their collider at 2 TeV, okay? Now, um, at, at 2 TeV, you can, um, you can make new particles with a mass up to 2 TeV. Now, it turns out for technical reasons, um, you, you really can't get up to 2 TeV, but you can, you can get it up to, um, and Katevi is actually an expert in this, but depending on uh, what you're looking for, you can get up to, uh, you know, one, one TeV or uh, half a TeV or something. Uh, above that, you can't, you can't make them by conservation of energy. So, however, what we do is quantum mechanics does not conserve energy. Now, this is a shock because you, because you learn, <laughs> this is a shock because you learn in freshman physics that energy is conserved and energy is conserved except in quantum mechanics. Um, so, so in our experiment, we're using quantum mechanics and we, 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 we can go above 2 TeV. Okay, but we wanna do both because all, all we're gonna say is there's more and we're not gonna be able to say what the new particles, what the new symmetries are. We can just say there's something missing. And the way you actually produce this and study it is, um, is with a collider. So, so this was a proton antiproton collider of two TeV. Uh, uh, so, so that's two times 10 to the 12 volts. So that's a lot of volts. Okay. But, but then at CERN in, in Geneva, Switzerland, they, they built, they upgraded their uh, collider. Their collider was below this energy and they upgraded it to 13 TeV. So, so now they can look for particles, you know, not up to 13 TeV mass, but up to, you know, something, um, you know, five or 10 TeV. Um, which, which is much higher than the Fermilab collider. So Fermilab went from the energy frontier to the intensity frontier. The intensity frontier means you're making a lot of muons and then, um, and then you use quantum mechanics to violate energy. Our, our, our beam is only at three GeV, which is, uh, you know, a, a factor of a thousand or something uh, less than that. But quantum mechanics allows access above 13 TeV. So, so, so they were building a beam line with 20 times more muons. Um, this means that, that we could measure it more accurately. Instead of half a ppm, we could go to a tenth of a ppm, which means going up to higher mass. So, so, so that's why we decided to move the magnet to Fermilab. Fermilab had the muons and we had the magnet. So yeah. what we had to do is get the magnet to, it, to the muons. So, so why didn't you dismantle everything, put it on the truck, drive it over there, and then at Fermilab you reassemble the magnet? Why do you have to move it so carefully? Um, right, so this is, a, this is a superconducting magnet, okay? Um, so, uh, so at, uh, these are very good questions, by the way. These are ab absolutely great questions. So, uh, so at, at five degrees above absolute zero, uh, this, this, this actually has um, zero resistance. 
In fact, for, for MRI magnets they use in hospitals, they, um, you know, they bring it down to 5K, they put the current in it, kiloamps of current, they disconnect the power supply, and then they move it to the hospital. Um, and you have kiloamps kilo of, uh, of, of current with, with no power supply. It's just, that's because resistance is zero. Now that's at five degrees above absolute zero. At six degrees, it's no longer a superconductor. So the resistance, in fact, the resistance is, is, um, is, is not as good as a uh, copper. A copper is not as good as a copper wire you have in your house for carrying electricity. Uh, now the, the stored energy of this is, is, is many, many megajoules. So, so what happens is then you have a, what's called a quench. Okay, and then you turn all, you turn all the liquid helium into gaseous helium and the pressure goes up by, if you didn't relieve it, the pressure would go up by a factor of a thousand and you'd blow the thing apart. So you, so you, you cannot damage the superconductor. If you damage the superconductor, you get a normal conductor and the whole thing is useless. Um, uh, that, uh, that's, that's called a quench. When, when you go from five degrees above absolute zero to six degrees above absolute zero. Okay, um, that, that, that's called a quench and you, 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 want to avoid, you want to avoid quenches. And the, and, the, and the engineers calculated that if this thing flexed by more than a millimeter, that we would damage the superconductor and it would no longer uh, be, be able to give us the superconductivity. Then the question is at ambient temperature is not a super, a super conductor anyway. So uh, how did you maintain all of those uh, quality of the magnet while transporting it? All uh, right, yeah, we have, we, have a mega, we have a megawatt refrigerator. Okay. So we have a megawatt re refrigerator, which continuously flows liquid helium through the magnet. Yeah, that, uh, uh, yeah, that's another that's another good question. Um, okay, so this was so, so we started planning this in 2010. Obviously, uh, the, the look took a lot of planning, and the engineers had to okay it. Um, we moved it in 2013. Now in 2014. We're putting it together at Fermilab. So Bill, there's another question about the, the, field, the magnetic field strength. Is, is he, uh, how many Tesla is that? Oh, it's, it's 1.45 Tesla. Okay. Um, our, 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 requ our, our requirement is that it had to be very uniform. So, um, so we couldn't saturate the uh, we couldn't saturate the iron. So, of course, that I mean, other places have have ten times higher field. Um, but we but we needed to be very uniform. So that was our requirement. Twenty fifteen, we finally put it all together. Uh, and we powered up the magnet. And the field shimming started. Now, okay, so now the whole question was, could we power the magnet and have it not quench? Because, uh, you know, if it quenched, it was useless. We couldn't do the experiment after five years of work and millions of dollars. So we, we powered it up, we got up to full current, everything was great. And then about three hours later, it quenched. So, <laughs> So this meant we had a disaster on our hands. Um, but then, th then we had a very smart guy, Eric Swanson at um, uh, University of Washington. He was analyzing the, um, the quench data. And um, 
he says, I can understand the quench data. If, the, if I mean, we had, we had a, a certain thing glued on to the um, coil. And he said, if, if it was no longer in good contact with the coil, so you know, may, maybe the glue was not so good in one place. So um, uh, th that could do it. That would do it. So, so we couldn't get to it. So we had to build a boroscope. So a little camera on the long end of uh, uh, something you snake through and you could look. So, so we, that took us uh, weeks to build and get it going. So we went in and looked and it had fallen completely off the coil. <laughs> and it was now at the bottom of the cryostat. So, um, so, okay, we fixed that. And after we fixed that, it was fine. <clears throat> I, I wasn't gonna say that, but um, since somebody asked the question. Okay, so th this is our magnet. Uh, Gordon Danby uh, built it. He, he always said that he, was, he would build it to be a kit. Okay, so we, we have you know the, the top hat iron here, we have the wedges, we have the edge swims, edge shims. <clears throat> and um, so we do this to, to, um, to shim it to get a uniform field because we, we need to know the field to uh, 0.1 parts per million. Okay, and then we measure it. There are fixed NMR probes, um, 378 of them above and below the muon storage region. This is where the muons uh, get stored. So, so the average of these, it should be the field in the middle, but it, it's not at the 0.1 ppm level, it's not. So we have this NMR trolley, which goes all the way around this 150 foot. Um, it has 17 NMR trolley probes. And we do this every three days. And that, that, that tells us if the average of these is, 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 is not exactly the same as, as what is in the middle. OK, so, so we started, we measured it first. And, and, and the uniformity was 1,400 parts per million, which is not good enough, obviously. So then we shimmed it with all those tools and we got down to 50 parts per million, which was the blue. Now the muons go all the way around. So what really matters is um, averaging the field all the way around. And you notice uh, at, at that point, it's, um, it's uniform to uh, 3.8 parts per million. Which, uh, Bill, which there's another question on the chat. Uh, if the the B field is not that strong. Why do you need superconductor magnet? Is it for uniformity or permanent B field? Now that's a that's a very very. We are we are getting great questions. I mean, these are very very good questions. Um, so 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 the reason is the stability, the L over R time constant. Okay, so if it was a normal magnet. The L over R, the stabil time stability, the L over R time constant would be like a millisecond. And that, you know, that would be terrible. Um, but with superconducting, the L over R time constant is um, it's about a minute. So we can, we can make many, many measurements. Over a minute, we can make many, many measurements uh, with all of our NMR probes. But if it was a millisecond, you know, we, we couldn't catch what, what it was doing. We wouldn't have the, the time stability. So it was, the, we, so we need spatial stability and time stability. No, these are very good questions. <clears throat> okay, finally in 2017, it was all put together and the, we hear our detectors installed <clears throat> going around the ring. Yeah, so, so you see, this is what experimentalists do, <laughs> which is, I'm an experimentalist. This is what, what the theorists do is calculate uh, all of those um, uh, theory diagrams. Okay, so in 2017, we were tuning the beam. And then finally, we got the beam tuned enough so that we kind of saw a, you know, a, um, a mu on g minus two, oscillation, which we call a wiggle. We call this the wiggle plot. <clears throat> and then in 2018 was the first physics run. 
So now we see a, you know, a nice wiggle plot. Okay, so the data taking is going from 2018 to 2022. Uh, the analysis is finished for the 2018 data, which is what we call run one. So we have about 10 billion muon decays, uh, this, about the same as the Brookhaven experiment. And by 2022, we will have like 200 billion muon decays. So much more accurately. So, so now, so here, here is the whole question. So here, here is the standard model. And here is what Brookhaven measured. So obviously this does not agree well with that, but it could have been a statistical fluctuation. So if it had been a statistical fluctuation, Fermilab would have measured here. Okay, but Fermilab didn't, they measured here, which is, which is uh, compatible with our number within one sigma. One sigma is very good. <clears throat> now we can add these two together and we get uh, this one. <clears throat> and now the uh, disagreement between the standard model and, uh, and our experiments 4.2 sigma. So, so this is the muon G minus two theory initiative. <clears throat> Uh, so this is the work of about a hundred theorists actually. And um, <clears throat> very recently, there has been uh, some controversy among the, uh, <clears throat> among the theorists. Um, so, so some of the theorists uh, are, are saying, some of the theorists recalculated one of some of those terms with a different method. And and they and they and they disagree with this, so um, so so the experimental value is now very good and will get better with time. And the, the theorists the theorists say they need uh, at least another year to to uh, to check that when when they calculate all those diagrams by different methods that they get the same answer. Anyway, um, from our point of view, it's. Uh, it's quite exciting. And we've shown that the BNL was not a statistical fluctuation. BNL should not have been here. Oh, but Bill, um, if the theory, new theory calculation comes to, are they, do we expect that they will overcome this four sigma difference? So that be, that, that would raise even more question as to why they got it wrong. <laughs> Before, right? So yeah. So um, so there were two me there were two methods. So the so the, the first method, which is um, um, and I and I, f I forget the name of it. It doesn't matter. Uh, that that has been going on for many 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 years. Okay. The the new method is lattice QCD. Mm. So they calculated some of the diagrams with lattice QCD, and they they disagree with the um, just oh it's dispersion dispersion relation. Mm -hmm. They dis disagree with the dispersion relation. Well, they're supposed to be calculating the same thing. Okay, so so they they need more time to to hash it out. So. Um, so if we go back to so if we go back to here, so this was in the B and L days. So you can see from 2006 they were using dispersion theory mm. and continually recalculating it. <clears throat> Recently, uh, the, they have uh, recalculated some of the diagrams with lattice QCD. Mm -hmm. And um, and there are two sets. What well, one set agreed extremely well, and the the other set is I think it's off by like two sigma, which you know could be a statistical fluctuation. So they, they need more time to uh, see if it's a statistical fluctuation or not. Okay, so we're getting closer to five sigma. Um, five sigma is is like the gold standard. And if you're going to if you're going to declare the 
standard model dead, declare there's new physics. Everyone agrees you should have five sigma. So we're, we're, we're getting closer to, to five sigma. Much more data is being analyzed now. The theorists are still calculating with supercomputers. The, the lattice QCD, they, they need supercomputers. They can't calculate it um, uh, on their laptop. So, uh, and so we expect to have um, runs. So I, so I showed you run one. We expect to have runs two and three analyzed by mid 2022. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Bill, um, for this talk, which is, um, I hope, at the level where uh, most of uh, us connected will understand what are the issues of these measurements and how import important it is uh, for physics beyond the standard model. Bill, could you comment if we uh, reach five sigma, what kind of uh, physics beyond the standard model will be uh, are people thinking about? Will be we need to invoke? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, so, so very, very good question. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, very good question. So, um, so, so, so so Katebi is on the uh, is on the energy frontier. So he he is working at this um, LHC collider in uh, Geneva, Switzerland. So um, now uh, what the, there's one theory that I really really like. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> There's one theory I really, really like. Now, Katevi's um, experiment has 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 looked for this, and and uh, they they haven't ruled it out, but they, what they, this tension uh, is is the, is the way they call it. So um, they looked very, very hard for this, and they didn't find it, and they set limits. And there there's tension about whether, given their limits, about whether this theory could explain this. Um, uh, our, our anomalous magnetic moment. Uh, I really, really, really like it. Okay. <clears throat> uh, it's called supersymmetry. And the reason I like it is because I love symmetries. <laughs> and this is a supersymmetry. So, so that, that's, that's why I like it. So, so let, me, um, let me tell you what it's the symmetry of. So um, once again, I don't know how the theorists do this, but the, the point K air symmetry is what gives us special relativity. So some theorists, and it's a rotation of an angle in some mathematical space. So some theorists said, Let, let's, let's try rotating by an imaginary number in this mathematical space. I don't know how they think of these things, but when they did that, they found an operator that would change a matter particle spin one half to a force particle, spin one. So there's an operator which changes an electron with spin one half into a force particle. So they call it a supersymmetric electron with spin one. Has all the properties of the electron except spin goes from half to one and that makes it a force particle. <clears throat> Now, um, the, the interesting thing about this is when you calculate these loops with matter particles and force particles, they come in with a different sign. So actually, if supersymmetry were unbroken, lambda would be zero. This would completely solve uh, the cosmological problem. Cosmological constant problem. <clears throat> um, now, now, of course, we now it's really 0.7. It's not this. So you would need a tiny amount of um, of symmetry breaking, and you could get this. Now, uh, Kitevi has shown us that we have we the amount of um, 
with with Katebi and at a limit, um, that that would reduce this supersymmetry by 60 orders of magnitude. 60 orders of magnitude reduction, which is huge, but that would still leave us leave us with 10 to the uh, 60 up here. So the, th the theorists are trying to work this out. How can we how can we have it be a broken symmetry of the amount we know we need um, and get this from 10 to the 60 down to 0.7? So, okay, supersymmetry is uh, is one, and also the, um, but the two Higgs doublet. Yeah, so, so supersymmetry connects matter, is a symmetry between matter particles and force particles. Uh, you know, I, I, I love symmetry, so that's why I like that. <clears throat> Now also the uh, the two Higgs doublet um, also could explain uh, mu and g minus two. So I mean you really need a theorist to tell you more than that. So okay, um, there was there is a question uh, on the chat from uh, Nicole. Uh, there seems to be a lot going on with the muons these days. Can you link the g minus two experiment with quark <laughs> beauty? experiment of LHCB? Yes. So as, as I said, in the standard model, uh, the muon is just a heavy electron. It doesn't have any other properties. Um, it just has a bigger mass than the electron. Now, there, there's also, from the LHCB experiment, there is, um, there, there, they also have a three sigma result. <clears throat> which is very interesting, which is B goes to K mu plus mu minus divided by B goes to K el uh, electron anti-electron. So, so, so you don't have to know uh, what the B and the K is. So if the muon is just a heavy electron, and then these two decay rates should be the same. And what they're finding is that they're not the same. They're not the same at the level of three sigma. Now, also there are other decays which show that the ta, so the muon and the ta should just be a heavy electron. There are other B decay experiments which show that the ta, if now I don't I don't think these experiments have quite the three sigma, but you know, two something sigma, that the ta is not just a heavy electron. And this, this is very, very, this is called lepton universality. In other words, we don't, we don't just have one kind of elect, one kind of lepton <clears throat> with different masses. Of course, the standard model, the guys who are calculating the standard model, that's what they calculate. The mu one is just a heavy electron. So that also, so it, it, it is also possible that it's, it's the same physics that's giving us, um, that's, that's telling us this, there's something, um, something fishy with the muon. So yeah, yeah, this is very interesting. They are taking more data and, and everyone is uh, is very very interested when they get more data. Will you know? Will their three sigma go away because it was statistical fluctuation, or will it become four or five sigma? Yeah, that another very good question. Questions so, are up. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, there was a hand raise. Uh, oh, but the hand has disappeared. So <laughs> the hands went down. Uh, okay. Uh, anybody has uh, questions or comments? Yes, uh, I have a question. I mean, I have a question about, I, I would like to know your, your personal opinion about this. It seems to me that nowadays, uh, uh, when we found something which is different from expectation, we used to go a little bit uh, faster and say that we have a new, we have new physics, or we have um, something beyond standard model. And my question, question is, uh, are there some theories which can explain these results in the standard model frame or not? <clears throat> um, 
No. Now, uh, no, no, we, we um, uh, ec no, excellent question, right. So, um, i just give you an example here. So then the standard model, they calculated quantum mechanics of the vacuum in the standard model of the 1960s and the effect on general relativity should be 10 to the 120th. Uh, Steve Weinberg says it has to be less than two for us to be here and it's discovered at 0.7. So th th this is a problem. <laughs> this is a big problem. Um, and now, uh, uh, I, 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 so this is dark energy. There's also a, a dark matter problem. So, 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 so what, what this is telling us is that 70% of the energy density of the universe comes from this uh, lambda, which is repulsive comes from quantum mechanics, 70% of the energy density of the universe. Now, um, so what about the matter? It turns out that um, also about 70% about of the matter is, is dark matter. So, so dark matter was discovered in the 1930s when they looked at rotation in astronomy, when they looked at rotation of galaxies and you, you put in Newton's law and it comes out wrong. So therefore, they discovered that 70% 70, 70 of uh, the matter of the universe is, is dark matter. So th there are many, many, many experiments trying to discover what dark matter is. But it's not in the standard model. It's not in the standard model. Uh, and and the, and there are there are uh, when the theorists write it. There are about four or five reasons that we know that the standard model is not complete. Yeah, no, these these are really these are really really excellent. Uh, up up to now, you know, we didn't, you know, we. <clears throat> Uh, you know, we didn't see any cracks in the standard model. We, we knew what was wrong, but we didn't see any experimental cracks. Now we're beginning to see three sigma, four sigma experimental cracks. And we'll have, we'll have to see if they can get up to five sigma. Excellent questions, very good. Thank you. Other questions or comments? All right, very good. So, uh, Bill, thanks, thanks a lot. This uh, is very uh, illuminating. Um, I hope everybody uh, understand uh, what is the excitement uh, around these measurements uh, uh, in terms of uh, what could be new physics uh, coming out of uh, these theory calculations and, and these uh, experimental measurements. So we'll see. So, um, all right, so at this point, before we leave, uh, we want to take a, a, a screenshot picture of people who like to have the, the picture taken. You can turn on your video. Uh, Bill, you can stop uh, the sharing uh, of your screen, yeah. Um, so if you are interested, um, I only see a few pictures here. <laughs> <laughs> other people really don't want to, but uh, um, so uh, I think uh, Munia, Munia, you're gonna take one, right? Um, wait. Thank you. Um, so I just took one. Um, uh, thank you. Um, so Bill, we we will uh, put the recording on the agenda page um, that's useful for people. Uh, there were some people who asked me whether it was gonna be recorded because they couldn't make it uh, on the time. And we also put the screenshot on the agenda page. Um, so again, Bill, thank you very much for being available to come and talk to us. Uh, this is really just really exciting. And we hope to get you back 
um, at the future version of the African School of Physics so that uh, you can have the opportunity to uh, talk to us again. And we look forward to seeing the analysis of the rest of the data. Uh, maybe we'll have a, sig a five sigma uh, discrepancy and, and, and we can start uh, celebrating uh, <laughs> <laughs> that there is something beyond the standard model, definitely. And uh, then people can start worrying about what is the nature of the new physics. Um, okay, so thank you very much. So I think uh, we'll stop here. Thanks uh, everybody for connecting. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye.